All right, church, I want you guys to open up to the shortest chapter in the Bible. Anyone know what that is? The shortest chapter in the Bible? The smallest chapter in the Bible. Anyone know what that is? It is a psalm. Psalm 117. Open up your Bibles to Psalm 117. It is indeed the smallest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Brother, we're coming to the text here, and this is indeed the smallest chapter in the Bible. As we see, it's only two verses long. Charles Spurgeon, in his commentary on the Psalms called The Treasury of David, says this about Psalm 117. Spurgeon says this, This psalm, which is little in letter, is exceedingly large in spirit, bursting all bounds of race or nationality. It calls upon all mankind to praise the name of the Lord. He goes on to say, A very short psalm, if you regard the words, but of great compass and most excellent, if you thoughtfully consider the meaning. Matthew Henry, writing on this psalm, says this, There is a great deal of gospel in this psalm. Martin Luther wrote 36 pages on Psalm 117, and let me remind you, it's only two verses long. Derek Kidner, British Old Testament scholar and commentator, well known for his work on the Psalms, says this about Psalm 117. This tiny psalm is great in faith, and its reach is enormous. In this psalm, we too are challenged not to measure God's kingship as His little flock. This psalm, he goes on to say, proves to be one of the most potent and most seminal. Psalm 117 is, in fact, the very middle chapter of your Bible. It is the middle chapter. There are 594 chapters that come before Psalm 117, and there are 594 chapters that come after Psalm 117. It is the 595th chapter in the Bible. And I find it fitting that Psalm 117 is indeed in the middle of the Bible. Because in this psalm, as we're going to see, it recalls all of God's promises that He is going to indeed save the nations. That the nations will come to know Christ. And also looks forward by faith to a time when, indeed, the Gentiles will come in to know Jesus Christ. You and I, as people of God. James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary on the psalm, says this of Psalm 117, that this is a profound missionary psalm. In church, it is my desire today that we would see more of the enormous reach and the enormous depth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that we would see, and that it would drive us as His people for more and more zeal to make Christ known in the world. As we, as uh, Spurgeon says, thoughtfully consider the meaning. Now, Psalm 117 breaks up nicely into two parts. We see it in verse 1. We see this, this call to praise of all the nations, all the peoples. And then in verse 2, we get the reasons for praise. So we get two parts, the call to praise, verse 1, and the reasons for praise in verse 2. Verse 1, praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. All peoples around the world are commanded. They are exhorted and they are pressed upon to worship the God of the Bible alone, the Lord. And Him only they shall serve. They are to praise Him. They are to, they are to make much of Him. They are to magnify Him. They are to worship Him. They are to give Him their full devotion. They are to find in Him their full satisfaction in the God of the Bible, in Yahweh. Every person, brethren, owes their, their allegiance to Him because He is the Creator. 
We read that over there in Revelation. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and power and strength, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We owe worship to God because He made us. He made us, and it's by His will that we were created. We are made by Him for Him. In fact, that is the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. He is the creator. He's the sustainer. He created us. He sustains us. He gives you breath. He keeps your heart pumping. He provides rain for the crops. He provides shelter and housing and every good thing that comes, comes down from God. He gives life. He sustains life. The peoples, all peoples everywhere are called to praise Him, to extol Him. And now in this text, what we see implied here is that all peoples are to turn away from idolatry. They're to turn. They're to turn from their idols. They're to worship Yahweh alone. They're to worship the Lord alone. They're to come to Him. This speaks of the exclusivity of Christianity, the exclusivity of Christ and the gospel. All roads, church, do not lead to heaven. There is one way. And Jesus said that He was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by Him. We read in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that Peter says that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other way. The nations are called, in Bible times here, to turn away from Molech. To turn away from Dagon, these false gods of the peoples. To turn away from Baal. To turn away from the ashram. To turn away from worshiping the stars and the, and, and the skies up in the heavens. They're called to turn away and to come and to worship the Lord. Come and worship the God of the Bible. There is indeed none like our God. In fact, He says Himself that He knows not of another. He alone is God. And we see this over in Isaiah chapter 46. You can turn there if you like. I want to read a couple of verses here in Isaiah 46. Verses 5 to 10. This is what the Lord says. He says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. Verse 7. They lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. And we see that. We see the peoples fashioning a God made by, made by human hands, made out of stone and metal and gold and silver, whatever else it is, and it cannot, it has no eyes to see, they have no ears to hear. Indeed, there is no power to save. But what does the Lord say? He says in verse 8, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes. He alone is God, and He alone knows the end from the beginning. He has a council. He has divine decrees, a plan for creation, and it will come to pass. All His purposes will come to pass. That is who our God is. There is no other God but Him. This is a call for the nations to turn away from their false gods. This is a call for today for the peoples of the earth to turn away from worshiping Buddha, to turn away from Muhammad, to turn away from the over 300 million gods of Hinduism. Church, over 300 million gods in Hinduism, and all of them with one too many arms. <laughs> if you ever look at their gods, they are fashioned 
made by human hands, and people put their trust in them. This is a, this is a call for Catholics to stop worshiping Mary, to stop upholding the saints higher than they do Christ, to come and to repent and to worship the Lord alone. This is a call for Mormons to turn away from the false god of Mormonism. This is a call for Americans to turn away from their god of paper, of money, of, of climbing the corporate ladder, of finding uh, satisfaction in, in the comforts and luxuries of life, to turn away from self-rule, to turn away from themselves as they have declared themselves to be God, to turn away from all of the idolatry that plagues our land. You know, in the Bible, we, we read that people would sacrifice their children to the God of Molech. And we read that and go, oh, that's heinous. That's heinous. And we have done the very same thing in our own country, sacrificing over 60 million children on the altar of convenience, brethren. It is a call to the nations to turn away. It's a call for the nations and the peoples to repent, to turn to the Lord, that there would actually be forgiveness. Turn away from your idolatry. Turn away from your false gods and come and worship the Lord. As we read in Isaiah 45, 22, Yahweh says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. What a gracious call. What a merciful call to the nations to the peoples, to you and to I, to turn, to come to Him and be saved. Why? Because he is, he is the only Savior. He is the one who can save. He alone has the power to save. What a gracious call to turn. To turn. And brethren, might I remind you that repentance is the call to the unconverted, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Repentance, to turn away. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon, brethren. That is the call in Scripture, to turn, to forsake your old ways and come to Christ. God will abundantly forgive, abundantly. As many of you in here can testify to the grace of God given to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent, to forsake. We get it also in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, when Jesus comes on the scene. He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Those are the first words out of the mouth of our Savior in Mark's gospel. To repent. That is the call of the gospel. To turn away from your sin and to believe in Christ. We get it over there in Luke chapter 24, where Jesus, after sacrifice, death, burial, resurrection... And he commissions his church, and he says in Luke 24 that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Repentance, brethren, that is the call to the unconverted. That is the call to the peoples of the earth to repent. And what do we see in the book of Acts? You read Acts, and you see that the, that the Spirit comes down and fills his people. We see... Peter preached that great sermon in Acts chapter 2, and the people were cut to the heart. And they tell Peter, what should we do? What does he tell them? Do a bunch of good works? No, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the call of the gospel, to repent we see it also in Acts chapter 17, where Paul says, he's preaching in Athens, he says that God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. And he has proven this by raising him from the dead, namely Jesus. God commands all people everywhere to repent to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Repentance is absolutely necessary for salvation. You have no salvation apart from repentance. You must repent. 
Jesus said in Luke 13, He says, Repent or perish. Repent or perish. And you might ask the question, well, what is repentance? Well, that's a great question. If I could just simply state it in its most basic terms, it is this. It is a change of mind. A change of mind of, of, of the way you have been thinking. Changing your mind to think, yeah, my life's okay. I'm doing all right. You need to change your mind. You're in grave danger. The wrath of God is coming upon the sons and daughters of disobedience. It's a change of mind to say, you, when, you, when you think little or nothing of Christ, to have a change of mind, to, to, to see that Christ is your only hope in this world. It is a change of mind. And in that change of mind, what happens is you turn away from sin. That's another aspect of repentance. A change of mind, a turning away from sin, and turning to God in faith is another aspect of repentance. And so in repentance in its most basic meaning is a, a, having a change of mind that would lead you to turn away and then turn to Christ by faith, clinging to Him, recognizing that He is your only hope in this world. And so the call here of the psalmist in, in chapter 117, to praise the Lord all nations, to extol Him all peoples, is also implied to repent. It's an implication of the text. To repent, to turn away, to abandon your idols and your sin and come and worship Yahweh. And listen, the, the call to the nations to come and worship and serve the Lord and Him only is not an empty call. It's not a cold call to them. Ah, oh, yeah, come on. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll receive you in. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe he'll welcome you. By no means. By no means. He has promised, God has promised to welcome the nations into the family of God. He has promised to save, brethren. He has promised to do that. And the promise of the nations being included in the people of God ought to encourage us. It ought to encourage us. Because this is, this is the ultimate purpose of God, is to have united praise from all the peoples of the world. That all the peoples of the world would, would honor and glorify His name, would magnify Him. People from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. All peoples coming to worship God, to submit to the Son and worship Him. And that ought to encourage us, church. You know, when you read the Psalms, 33 of the 150 of them have a, uh, a call to the nation to either worship the Lord or obey the Lord. So you figure 30, we'll say 30 out of 150 is, is how much? How much percentage of that is? One-fifth. That's right, one-fifth. There you go, you're listening. That's good. That's 20% that's of the Psalms. You read through the Psalter, you read through the Psalms, and you see constantly calling out to the nations to come to, to, to worship Yahweh, to worship the Lord, to come to obey Him, to submit to Him. Brethren, if you want to, to, to grow your zeal and your love for God's global plan to save the peoples of the world, read the Psalter. Read through the Psalms. And you will begin to see God's, God's plan for all peoples of the earth. You will begin to see it. The, the, the future inclusion of the nations among God's people is a prominent theme in the Psalms. It's prominent. It's all over the place. I want to show you just a couple of these uh, as we're talking on this subject of the promise of the nations. Let's go to Psalm 45 or 47, excuse me. Psalm 47. I want to just read a couple of these. So again, I want us to understand this, okay? That that the call to the peoples of the earth to come and worship the God of the Bible alone is not just a cold, uh, uh, insincere call for them to come. In fact, they're called to come because God has welcomed all the nations to come. He has promised to save. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at right now. And I want to show you a couple things here. Let's look at verse 7 uh, in Psalm 47. 7 to 9. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with the psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. 
For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. We see that God reigns over the nations. He reigns over them and they belong to Him. They belong to Him. And He reigns over the nations. He sits as King over all of them. If that's general, let's go to something more specific. Let's go to Psalm 87. As we think about the promise of the nations coming and being included in God's salvation. Psalm 87. We'll read verses 4, 5, and 6. This is God speaking here in the inspired word. We see here, Among those who know me, I mention Rahab, that's Egypt, and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, This one and that one were born in her. For the Most High Himself will establish her. The Lord records as He registers the peoples. This one was born there. If Psalm 47 was a general promise and a general understanding of God ruling the nations and the nations actually belong to Him, Psalm 87, 4, 5, and 6, we get specific nations, all nations, coming in to know God. This is, this is the Psalms anticipating that these nations are going to be registered in God's city. We have entire nations bowing down to Yahweh to serve Him. What, what, what glorious anticipation that sets us up for the New Testament. This is what goes on in the Old Testament. The call, the promise, the looking forward to the day when the nations will in fact come. And we see it not just in the Psalms, like I said, but this is the thrust of the entire Bible. I want to show you guys this, what, what I mean by this being the, 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 the thrust of all of Scripture. Flip with me over to Romans 15. So Romans 15 was our New Testament reading. And I want to show you a couple of things here in Romans 15. This text really deserves its own full treatment, but I just want to point out a couple of things here. So in this text, Romans 15, 8 to 13, that, that Sergio read for us, Paul is picking up here on God's plan for the nations. Now in the context of what's going on in Romans 15, it's kind of important. Uh, because we don't, you know, okay, it's important. So, <laughs> we don't want to just pull Scripture out of context, right? So, so, Paul has been laying out for the last two chapters how and why Jew and Gentile are to relate in the church, okay, as one people of God. And he's bringing his argument now to a climax. And we see that in verse 7 of 15. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And then he says in verse 8, 4, this is why. This is why Jew and Gentile, and Gentile just means non-Jew. All right, that's kind of a... You know, it's, it's a biblical word, but we need to understand what that means. Gentile just means non-Jew. Jews and non-Jews are to relate in the church as the one people of God. And Paul says, this is why that is. He says, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the, to the circumcised, that's the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. So we have two reasons here why Christ became a servant, why He came into the world to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Christ came into the world in order that He would accomplish salvation for the world. The promises to the patriarchs, we just think of this think Old Testament, you think patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, did in fact not exclude all the peoples of the earth, but actually included them from the very beginning. And we read that, right? And in Genesis chapter 12, that God was going to bless Abraham, and through Abraham's seed, through him, 
all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. So the inclusion of the promises to them did not exclude people like you and I. We are not Jewish people. We are Gentiles. Unless, unless I know otherwise, I don't know. But I'm a Gentile, and most of you are Gentiles. Okay? And, and, and so God has come to do two things. We have always been included in the plan of God. Always. And then he says this. And, verse 9, and this is where I want to focus here. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. And then he says, as it is written. And in your Bibles, you'll probably see that the, that the uh, font here, the, the ordering of the paragraph changes a little bit. Paul, or, or it's all capital letters, amen? amen. All right. And, and that's how we know now Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. And Paul is quoting from a number of different places here to prove his point. To say, hey, look at Jew and Gentile were always to be in the church together. Christ came to unite the two, one people of God, through faith in Him. And He says, Therefore, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's Psalm chapter 18. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. That's Deuteronomy 32. And again, verse 11, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. Sound familiar to anyone? That's Psalm 117, verse 1. Amen. So there's our text here. The only time it's quoted in the New Testament is right here. That's why I'm coming here. And then again, verse 12, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. And in him the Gentiles will hope. And we read that text in our Old Testament reading. That Isaiah was talking about a coming day when the Messiah would come. This, this root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, would come and He would rule the Gentiles. And in Him, the Gentiles would hope. Now, I want you to, to, to notice something here. Brethren, we are recipients of the mercy of God. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ... That mercy is yours. It is unmerited, undeserved mercy. We do not deserve the salvation of God. None of us. Nobody. It is mercy. If you guys know Dave Shoemaker, he, he always wears this shirt. I love it. It's black. It says, I deserved wrath, but instead got mercy. And that, that is a profound biblical truth. That all of us deserve the wrath of God. But God in His mercy has opened the door for people like you and I to be saved. And it has always been His plan. Now notice this though. Remember, I'm talking here about the entire thrust of Scripture. Paul quotes from a few different places. But I want you to notice something here. He quotes from the law, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. He quotes from the prophets, Isaiah. And he quotes from the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 18 and Psalm 117. So he quotes from the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Remember in Bible study, if you guys were here a couple of Fridays ago, we talked about this. When Jesus says in Luke 24, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, when Jesus said in Luke 24, He says, uh, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything, Jesus says, written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And remember what Aaron talked about in that Bible study. That it's not just some obscure text that, that, that is pointing to the person and work of Christ in the Old Testament. It is the thrust of the Old Testament. That the, that the Messiah would suffer, that He would die, that He would be raised from the dead. So you remember that threefold use of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms was a nice way of saying all of the, all of the Bible speaks of this. The, Paul is using the same thing here. He is saying that all of the Bible speaks to this idea that God is going to save the Gentiles. He's going to save the peoples of the world. He's going to bring them into one church to worship through Christ. And brethren, that ought to encourage us. That ought to encourage the people. That yes, indeed, God promised, and it's actually happening. You're proof of it. You are proof that you are glorifying God for His mercy. Now, what does that look like? 
glorifying God for His mercy? Well, it looks like all the, what these texts are saying. To praise, to sing, to rejoice, to, to extol, to put our hope in. That's what that text in uh, 15, 12. And in Him will the Gentiles hope. Brethren, hope, the supreme object of our hope, will be the supreme object of our worship. What we are putting our hope in the most will be the object of our worship. And for every true believer in Jesus Christ, their hope is found in nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness, nothing. It is found in no other place. And for you, I want to encourage you to look and continue to look to Christ as your only hope in this world. To cling to Him. To glorify Him for His mercy, church. Now notice also in here that Jesus became a servant so that the Gentiles would glorify God. God saves so that God would be worshipped. God saves for His own glory that He would receive worship. Church, glorify Him for His mercy. You deserve wrath. You deserve wrath, but instead we got mercy. Another implication here. We got the promise to the Gentiles that they will indeed come in. And another implication here from Psalm 117 is this. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. What's implied here, church, is that if the nations are going to be summoned to come and to praise the God of the Bible alone, then the people of God have a responsibility to go out and to proclaim that message to the peoples. We have a responsibility to be involved in missions and evangelism. Church, we read it in Romans chapter 10. How are they going to believe in Him of whom they've never heard? How can people believe in this Christ, believe in this gospel, believe in the good news if they've never heard of Him? Or if they're not told? They need to be told. Come to Christ. Turn, repent, believe the gospel. They need to be told that, church. And how are they going to hear that someone preaches to them? And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? That is what is implied here. We need to be a people involving ourselves in missions and evangelism. And listen, your passion for God and your zeal for His glory to be made known around this earth are deeply connected. Let me say that again. Your passion for God and your zeal for His glory to be made known are deeply connected. Whether you want to be a missionary or not is irrelevant. You could have a deep commitment to God's work around this earth without ever leaving Las Vegas, ever. Being committed in prayer, being committed to give financially as we, as we desire to do as a church, to be committed to, to contacting missionaries, to, to talking with them, exhorting them to things like helping missionaries or potential missionaries with logistical things back home, like running to grab a document or a form or taking care of a car or getting mail or these other kinds of things, brethren. There are a number of ways that you could be deeply involved in getting the gospel to around the world without ever leaving Las Vegas. We can go on short-term trips, visiting churches, to strengthen them, to encourage them in the faith. There is a lot of different ways that we as a people of God can be involved with getting the gospel to the nations. And of course, as I always pray for this church and for you by name, that God would raise you up and send you out of here to go proclaim the gospel. So that is also, of course, another way to do that. But my point is, it doesn't matter if you want to be a missionary or not. Your passion for God and your zeal to see His glory made known, they're, they're connected together. That's the relationship in Psalm 117. I mean, think about this. The, the, the psalmist is, is, is exclaiming, praise the Lord, all nations, calling them to praise Yahweh, to come to the God of the Bible, to praise Him, to extol Him, all peoples. Why? 
For great is his steadfast love toward us, and his faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. His passion for God, he knows who God is. He knows him. And so he's calling the nations out to come and to gather and to worship him. To praise and exalt God because he knows his character. He's, he's essentially, in essence, saying, come, come, and, and this great God would be gracious toward you if you would but come. His, his steadfast love is great toward us, and it could be great toward you if you would just but repent, if you would but come. He knows the steadfast love of God. He knows the faithfulness of God. You see, they're connected there. The more we love Christ, the more we are consumed with Him, the more we, that we deeply worship Him, the more we're going to want to see people come to faith, church. You see that? They are deeply connected. John Piper, love John Piper. In his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, good book, be careful if you read it, you'll want to be a missionary. But <laughs> John Piper in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, he, uh, he says this in there, talking about this connection between worship and our passion and zeal for the gospel to be made known around this world. He says this, it's like the first paragraph of the book, so easy to find. He says, worship is the fuel of missions. Passion for God and worship precede the offer of God in preaching. So passion for God in worship comes first before offering God in preaching. He says, you cannot commend what you do not cherish. Missionaries, or anyone really, will never call out, let the nations be glad, if they cannot say from their heart, I rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Psalm 104, 34, and Psalm 9, 2. Missions begins and ends in worship. You see what he's saying there? If we do not cherish God in our heart, if we personally are not exulting in who He is, then we will not be able to say to the nations, come. It, we won't do it. We just won't do it. Our zeal will not be that what it ought to be. And so we need to be cultivating as a church individually and corporately a deep passion for God. Because that's what, that's what missions is. Missions is, is, is an outflow. I can put it this way. It's an outflow of our worship of God. It really is. And so those things are connected. They're connected. And so, brethren, for us, I, it's my desire that we would grow. That we would grow in our passion for Him and our love for Him. That we would worship Him. And that would overflow into us seeking to make God's gospel known among the nations. And so what we see happening here in this first verse, we see the nations are called to repent. The nations are promised of their inclusion. They will, God will welcome them. It's been His plan from the beginning. And we see the duty of the church to missions and evangelism in verse 1. And now we're going to move on into verse 2 of Psalm 117, the reasons for praise. He says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So the question is why? The nations are summoned. You and I and every single person in this world is summoned to come and to praise God alone. To repent and to come and worship Him. Now why? Well, the psalmist tells us here two things here. And I could summarize this as saying because of who God is. Because of who He is. He is great in steadfast love. And His faithfulness endures forever. The why, the reason for praise is because of who He is. He is a merciful God. He is a loving God. He is a faithful God. Now, other translations have here that because, or they say this, He loves us with unfailing love, or His love towers over us. 
Now, this word here for great, great is his steadfast love toward us. The idea here is that it is strong, that it's prevailing, that it's, it's overtaking or overcoming. It has this idea of someone or something else prevailing over something else because of its superior qualities. Now, hear me out here. You, we see this in Genesis chapter 7, when the flood waters prevailed over the earth. The flood waters mightily prevailed and covered the whole earth. They took over the sense of, of strong, the, the waters prevailing over the earth in the flood. We see it in Exodus chapter 17, when Moses and Israel went out to fight the Amalekites. And Moses was lifting up his hands, and when his hands were lifted, the Israel was winning the war. And then when his hands got tired, they fell down, and they were losing the war. And so what did they do? They sat Moses on a rock, and they one guy on each side. Aaron held up his arm, and uh, was it uh, Joshua held up his arm, and then Israel prevailed over the Amalekites. So we see it there, the sense of of, of strong prevailing, overtaking, overcoming, conquering something else. We see it also in Psalm 65. I want you to turn there. This prevailing love of God and, and, and looking at this word prevailing. Psalm 65 verse 3. When iniquities prevail against me. You atone for our transgressions. So we have the idea here of sin. Sin prevailing over you. Listen, church, when sin has a tendency to begin to prevail over you, you need to and must know that there is atonement and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ, that you would look to Him. When you are battling and fighting with sin, you need to know that Christ atoned for your sins. And this is the same for all who are not Christians. That when iniquities prevail, that there is atonement. That there is. There is a Savior. And His name is Christ. But this is the idea here again of iniquities prevailing. This idea of prevailing, overcoming. And so what we see here in this text is that where sin increases, grace abounded all the more, church. And praise God for that. That God actually atones for the sins of His people. That there's actually atonement found in Christ. Now, this idea of prevailing pertaining to the steadfastness of, of, uh, of the love of God has, has this idea that it's a prevailing love. It's a love that conquers. It's a love that overcomes. It's, a, it's a, the prevailing love of God in the gospel that prevails over sin, that prevails over death, that prevails over Satan, that prevails over hell. It's that kind of love. The prevailing, steadfast love of God for us, for the people of God. It's the love of God that prevails over sin. Now, flip with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, of this prevailing love of God in the gospel, prevailing over sin. We read this in verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, and the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Church, we were dead in our sins. It is sin that has separated us from God. And we were by nature children of wrath, 
following the course of this world, following the, the, the desires of our body, just living however we wanted, unable to love God. And God comes in, and because of His rich mercy and His great love, He makes you alive in Christ. That is the love of God in the gospel that prevails over sin. And we see also down in verse 11, when he says, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made, by the, made in the flesh by hands. Remember, he's talking to us. Remember that we were at one time separated from Christ, alienated, strangers, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were separated spiritually and positionally, physically separated. Had no idea of God's work in this world. Spiritually unable to love God. And God comes in and He conquers all of that. He brings us near by the blood of Christ. He makes us alive because of His mercy and His great love for us. Through Jesus Christ in the gospel. It's a prevailing love of God in the gospel that prevails over sin. It's also prevailing over death. Jesus said in John chapter 11 verse 25, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Christ conquered death. He conquered the grave. And when you put your trust in Christ, when you cling to Christ, whoever, he says, believes in me, though he die, he will live. We will live with him forever. Death does not have the final say. As we read over there in 1 Corinthians 15, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Because of what Christ has done in the gospel, he conquers death, he conquers sin. The prevailing love of God conquers Satan. Church, he conquers the enemy. In the gospel, the enemy has been bound together. He has been bound up. We read this over there in Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus says that he has come in and he has bound the strong man in order to do what? Plunder his house. Amen. And, and what's in Satan's house? The nation's. The peoples, you and I, being deceived in the power and this whole world in the power of the evil one, but no longer. Why? Because Jesus Christ has come and He has bound the strong man. He has bound him. He has plundered his house and He is saving the peoples. We read this also in John chapter 12. I'm going to go quick here, but if you want to, well, I guess I can slow down. There's no, there's no clock in here, so it always makes me a little nervous, but I don't know. <laughs> Can I, ever, I don't even know how long I've been preaching for. In, in John chapter 12, on this, on this idea that the prevailing love of God overcomes Satan, we read that Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 31, He says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world, that is Satan, be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to Myself. Christ says that now is the judgment. The ruler of this world, Satan, he's cast out. He's on, no longer able to deceive the nations. In Christ, when he is lifted up, when he is crucified, he will draw all kinds of people. All the nations are going to come to know Christ. People from everywhere, like we read, from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation, Christ has redeemed with his own blood. Satan is decisively defeated upon the cross of Christ. We read over there in Colossians chapter 2 on the same idea. In Colossians 2.15, we read that He disarmed the rulers and authorities, spiritually speaking, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him or in the cross. That Christ triumphed. He conquered Satan and his reign upon the earth. In, 
his death, burial, and resurrection put them to open shame. And now as we read in Revelation 20 that Satan is bound and he is bound to the, to the end that he can no longer deceive the nations. And church, what do we see since the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ and the giving of the Spirit? We see the gospel going out and going out mightily in power and spreading all over this earth. Everywhere. He is bound. Unable to deceive the nations any longer. It is a prevailing love of God in the gospel that conquers and prevails over Satan and also hell. Listen, I've been thinking about this this week and to my own shame. Thinking of that verse that is the most popular verse in the Bible by far can be quoted by a number of unconverted people. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever, whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. What a loving God. What a loving God to send His Son into the world for the purpose of whoever. You know what whoever means? It means whoever, anybody, anyone would come to Christ, would believe upon Him, would not perish, but would have eternal life. Church, His prevailing love toward us is a reason for praise, and it is a reason for those who do not know Christ to come to Him, to come to Him, that He will welcome them. Also, number two reason for praise, this one will be a little shorter, His faithfulness. For great is His steadfast love toward us. And there's room for you, all nations, all peoples, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. And you think about this, un undoubtedly Israel could say at this time that God has been faithful to them. Certainly it was a reason for them to praise Him that these people failed multiple times. And God, and, and, and they deserve to be destroyed on a number of occasions. But what do we, excuse me, what do we read in the Bible? That God constantly is being recalled to the promises that He made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And we see Moses all the time in the Old Testament saying, Lord, you can't. You can't destroy them. You made promises. And God being faithful to His Word, being the faithful God to carry out what He has promised He said He would do. God is faithful. And His faithfulness endures forever. He will always be faithful. He is truly the faithful God. He will never go back on what He has said. Ever. Ever. He is true to His Word. One commentator uh, sums up this last little section here as this. All of God's plans and promises are as fresh and intact now as on the day when they were made, and they will remain so. Listen, church, you read your Bible, and you see God being faithful 2,000 years ago, you need to know something. He's faithful today. He will be faithful tomorrow. He will continue to be faithful. And that, is, and that ought to be encouraging for us. Did not Christ say, does not God say, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out? That is a promise made in the Scriptures that whoever would come to Christ, whoever would come, He would by no means cast them out. By no means. He is faithful to His Word. Did Christ not say, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? He will, Lord. He, he will. He will build His church. Did Christ not say that I will be with you to the end of the age? Church, He said that. And He is faithful to do it. To be with His people as they go out, as He has said, to make disciples of the nations. That He will be with you to the end. 
He is faithful to do that. Did Christ not say that I will lose none of those to whom the Father has given me, but all will come? All of them. He will lose none. You know, that is what really encouraged and, and, and moved Charles Spurgeon to salvation there. The, that, 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 that understanding of the Scriptures, that Christ will lose none. So I'm going to tell you right now, if it's, if it's dependent upon you and I, we, we, would have, we would have fallen away a long time ago. But it's not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon God. God has said in His power that He will lose no one. He will see fit that they make it to the end. That's a God we could trust. When we come to Him, He says that we'll never be cast out and He will never lose any of His people. Has not God said, whoever believes has eternal life? Brethren, He's faithful. Has He not said that if you seek Him first, He will provide all that is needed for you? Did He not say that? He's faithful. He's faithful, church. Listen, do you know His prevailing love? Do you know it? Do you know His faithfulness? Do you know the mercy of God given to you in the gospel? And church, then declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. And let us, as the psalmist says, let us praise the Lord. Let's pray.